my name is Patrick McKenna. Um, I'm a consultant spinal surgeon at the Royal Berkshire Hospital and I perform spinal fusions. Spinal fusion is simply connecting uh, two parts of the vertebral body together. So you're immobilizing one of the motion segments in the spine. And spinal fusion is done for several reasons, whether it be instability, neural compression, pain, uh, the commonest reasons we do it. And we're just trying to get a technique whereby you can stabilize two of the vertebral bodies together. And there are four main ways you can do it. You can do an uninstrumented fusion whereby you simply take off some bone and you pack bone around it and hope it fuses. You can put screws in through the back of the spine, connected with rods, which we'll show you later in the form of a Zia fusion. Um, you can put you can come through the front of the spine and you can put a block in the front of the spine. You can come in through the side of the spine and put a block in the spine. So there are several different ways which you can ways you can fuse the spine. It's it's called an instrumented posterolateral fusion. Um, instrumented, obviously, it has instruments in it. Posterolateral meaning you're coming from the posterolateral side, and it's not strictly an anterior fusion because you're not fusing the two vertebral bodies between themselves. You're indirectly fusing around the back of the spine. It has the same effect of immobilizing the two vertebral bodies, but it's not direct anterior fusion. The most common reason um, that I perform spinal fusion is in the older population where the spine becomes unstable. And what happens is the facet joints at the back of the spine fail to hold them anymore and they slip out of line. So one vertebra, vertebra will slip off the other one. When that happens, the nerves get compressed. Now normally when nerves get compressed, we decompress the spine. So we take the posterior elements off the spine and the old laminectomy or one, some of our laminotomy techniques that we do. And when we decompress the spine, it, it depends on the spine being stable afterwards. If there's already a slip and you take away bone at the back of the spine, you risk that slip becoming worse. So the spondylolisthesis, which means slip vertebrae, becomes worse. Mm -hmm. It's those patients that you tend to stabilize one way or another. One of the, one of the ways we fuse should be, one of the techniques we use should be used. And that's the most common indication that I have for putting screws in the spine. Um, the first thing you do, you have the patient set up on the table. Um, usually in a prone position, it's very difficult to get in from the side, but never, nothing's impossible. Um, you have them opened over a frame in the majority of times, so they're just open a little bit. You prep and drape the patient. You can take an x-ray localization to work out exactly what level of the spine you're going to go to. Um, the first thing you do is open the skin. Then I personally use cutting diathermy to expose the spine. So you simply go down the side of the spine and then move the muscles out of the way and then you can see the bony architecture of the spine. It's whenever you fully establish the bony architecture that then you can go ahead with the fusion. So you decide which levels you're going to do and then the first thing you do when you've got your landmarks is you use the starter. The starter is a very sharp awl that penetrates the bone. It's cortical bone on the outside and is of course tough. The normal entry point is just at the junction of the facet joint or the superior facet articular process and the transverse process. This, in this model, the transverse process is cracked off here, but we're going to just put one in there anyway. So normally at the junction of those two, you would make your starter hole. So simply by pushing in and a twisting motion, and then you have your starting hole. The next thing I would ask for would be the pedicle finder. There are two types of pedicle finder, one straight and one curved, and each surgeon has their own preference. I prefer this one. The reason being that if I put it in, and I, you're always a little scared to go towards the nerves, by putting it in the way, so you tend to always point outwards, so it hits the wall and pulls you in a bit. So it just seems a little safer in my hands. So you simply push it at the predetermined angle, and gently press down, and it takes some firm pressure, and eventually you'll enter the pedicle, straight into the pedicle body, and I normally go down to somewhere around the 45 or 50 millimeter mark, which in the adult spine is about the depth you need. That then comes out, and we go on to a little instrument called the Leibinger. 
It's a feeler and it's simply a very flexible piece of metal with a ball bearing at the end. And what you can do with that is just feel that you're in a tube of bone. It's very sensitive. So that feels like a solid tube of bone all the way around, like I can drag it around the four quadrants and know that I haven't penetrated the canal, that I'm inside the pedicle, which is where the pedicle screw must sit. If you feel a defect, so there's a softness, you can actually feel neural tissue or you can feel nerve or you can feel something else, you've got to reassess. Um, what we tend to do, and most, most people now, um, would stick a little probe in. The probe is very simple, it's just a metal bar, again goes in, and you can put multiple ones in, and then take an x-ray, and you can prove that you're down the centre of the pedicle in that view. The next stage is to tap. If you have hard bone, we have a cutting tap, um, which is fluted and cutting in its nature. You undersize usually, so you use a, a tap that's a little bit smaller than the screw you want to put in. But that's very useful for just getting you started in the bone. And traditionally, you go forwards and then a little bit backwards, forwards and a little bit backwards, just to clear the bone. When you've started that, you can then put your screw. Um, the screw's loaded here, um, but we can show you how that's done. Um, here we go. So if I wanted a 45 millimeter um, screw, this one's five and a half in diameter. You can hold it still, and wind it on till it's locked and then it's nice and solid. That can then be placed in the bone and screw following the traje trajectory that you had before. And you can see it's even stiff in this bone. I should right? come, come and help you. <laughs> and it does feel like there's a real bone as well. It's nice and solid. Oh. A little split. Then this can be undone, and then you have a bone, a spine with a pedicle screw in it. And what is the next stage? So you put, put multiple screws, <laughs> yeah, multiple, multiple screws, yeah. um, and then you connect them up. So if you want, I'll do. Yes. Shall I do that? Shall yes. I do that? Yes. Okay. So again into the junction, nice hole, we have a pedicle finder, a pedicle probe, it just goes down, you make your route in, load up our screw, We can tap if we want to. This bone is soft, so I don't feel I need to. Okay, we've got a little crack in the bone here, which does happen in humans as well. next thing is to size a rod. Um, most, most kits have rod sizes on it, but I tend to just say mm, that's about 40. So I'll pick a 40 rod. See if it fits. So place it in and it's just about right. Once that's been held in place, well, we can then put our caps on. The caps then seal the tulip head and they cause it to go stiff and do it all the way. So a little bit of movement there. Thank you.
how you fuse with a pedicle screw. You then need to finely tighten because although it's in and it's nice and stiff, just handheld, we can cold weld these. They're designed so that whenever you the screw to start with is polyaxial, so it moves. What you want it is to be welded. And the way they've designed it is as soon as you get the correct torque on it, this becomes absolutely solid. And so we have a counter torque you can put on, thank you, and, then, and a torque wrench. This wrench is designed to go to a certain force, that's 12 newton meters, and then it is absolutely locked. And the same on that one. It is cold welded and solid and it will not move. There we go. So this segment will not move. Mm. And in case that you have to put uh, screws on the other side? Uh, yes, you do. If you have no anterior support, um, so if we're just doing a post lateral fusion, which is the pure Zia fusion, then you would do the same on both sides. Okay. Are there any chance to be, do you have to connect them somehow or to have more stability? Or? No. Um, for one level, I don't think you do, but if you do multiple levels, so if we were doing four levels, for example, then there's a shear problem. So the rods will shear and so you can get movement. So for those ones, um, we'll put what's called a cross connector on. So you simply measure across, it'll be about, let's see, 69 it says here. Uh, so it'll be one of the longer ones. And you have cross connectors just like this, which will then fit on and join rod to rod. Mm -hmm. And that will give the stability either way. Um, you just turn that, that will give a lot. stability from rod to rod um, so that the shear removes. It doesn't do that anymore, it's locked. Um, there are lots of, well, from an instrument, from an instrument point of view, um, bones do better under compression or, um, and so we have compression in instruments. That at the, it's the only other thing we didn't say, which was at the end of the procedure you can compress down. Um, so we missed that, but we just oh, put it on and you'll squeeze it and when you squeeze it in like that these arms will just push it down and one of the important things about spinal fusion is getting the restoration of lordosis so the reason that all our rods are curved or you know, that they're all curved or the reason that we have benders in here to, to actually you know, lots of instruments to actually bend the, the rods to make sure the thing is because what we want to do is maintain the balance. So you want to maintain the curve in the back um, is very important. And that's where those instruments come in to pull down at the back of the spine in order to curve it. And so there's a little bit of finesse that goes into the final stages from our point of view. Um, that we're often saying at the end, oh, can we please have the compressors or the distractors? And we're trying to open one side or close another in order to balance the spine. That's the only other thing that we I'd touch on. The best, the, what you want from your scrub team is efficiency and being able to predict what you need in advance. And also some of the, some of these systems, this system is actually terrible. I struggled the other day, um, we had a scrub team that didn't know how to put this screwdriver together and it took us an extra 20 minutes to do the case because I'd never learned how to put it together and the scrub team I had had never put it together. And so we had delays built into surgery which was, you know, Suboptimal, shall we say, um, and use many different types of kit over the years, and they always change. But it's very good that a scrubless would know how everything works beforehand, would have seen and prepared for the case, would have been through the manuals, and hopefully done a dry run within a recent time period to be able to say, "Yeah, that's how it all goes together." And once you have um, your scrub nurse who knows how everything goes together, you suddenly have more confidence. It's then about understanding um, what you do each time. And it is, it is fairly repetitive. It is always starter, finder, feeler, tap, screw. And so we know what order they're coming in. And so to always say, could I have the next instrument, 
is unnecessary because as part of the team you can say there you go that's obviously because you're watching and you know what's next so you can just go bang there you go um, you can even prepare the screws knowing that you know in most of our cases now 45 50 or 55 will be the size of the screw you can know and predict which screws we're going to use you can ask us to prepare for you by saying you know can you measure the, on the x-rays or on the scans what length of screw you want and we can tell you what we're likely to want um, you can then pre-mount them so it's all ready and it's about it's it, it's about knowing those steps and the other thing is whenever we get some of the more complex when it's just difficult to get in it's knowing what other equipment they provide so just simple things we can't get in we're struggling and um, you know just offering us one of these because we'll struggle away for half an hour trying to get a screw when actually all we need is some a simple lever like this just to lever the tissue out to give us the view we want and if you can become involved to that that's very very good for us we go home earlier. So. Uh, difficult to choose which one was the worst one. Um, I think there are two. There are a couple of um, there are a couple of scenarios where you'll really worry, and one will be where the bone doesn't hold, and so you you put a screw into what seems like cheese instead of good bone, and you can never get a hold. And then when you put the rods in, you just see the screws coming out and coming loose. Um, which is a combination of patient failure and probably us asking too much of the, inf of the instrumentation. So that, that becomes very stressful because you've lost the stability. So if you've decided to stabilise someone's spine for a reason, then you've operated on to take away the elements at the back, you made them more unstable, and then you say, don't worry, we'll put the screws in and hold it, and it doesn't hold, then it's extremely disappointing for everyone involved. Um, you then have to have other methods to get out. Um, long screws, so putting screws too long um, are, is always a worry because just in front of the spine lays, lies the inferior vena cava and the aorta. So you don't need to go very much further um, than our screws. If you put in a, let's just see, a nice ooh, a 55 screw into the wrong patient, you can see that you can be out the front. These are sharp screws with cutting, with, these will cut, so that if they sit next to a vessel, um, they will rupture through the vessel. So putting the wrong length screw in, um, it's not something you do on purpose, but if you have a very heavy patient, you can't see the x-ray and you find afterwards, that's one of the scenarios where by which you just go, you know, do we take them back and take it out? And then it's a risk, you have to balance the risks and how to work out whether you take it out or not. Well, it's a, that's a difficult one, it comes in different stages. So if you want to say to a patient, when will, their patient says, when will I be better? When will I have a back that you consider to be my best result? It would be at one year. Mm -hmm. And commonly we'll tell patients it'll take you a year to get better. If you look at the early recovery and how we see them recovering, um, they usually have a fair amount of pain for about two days um, because of the muscle stripping to get in. And when that drops back, it aches a lot. Um, they often say on day two, oh, yesterday was awful. Um, they should be up and mobile day two or three, home by day three or four, and that means they're uncomfortable on pain cuffs, but okay, they're mobilizing around the ward. And then at about two weeks, most of the surgical pain should start to settle. Then they have some physio, a bit of exercise, start walking, and then by week six, when we see them in clinic, the expectation is they should be walking and going, I think it's working. And that would be fine for us, that would be a good result. Um, but there's a proportion of patients that will come back over months and months waiting for the bone to fuse and for it to solidify up properly and then they'll get their final result. Mm -hmm.